This lecture covers material on descriptive statistics. In particular, it's going to cover measures of central tendency and variability, which are also covered on the pages in your textbook shown here. Now, this is also material that you should have been exposed to in Stats 261, the prerequisite for this course. So we're going to cover it pretty quickly. I just want to introduce the notions as we're going to use them during the semester. In particular, when we talk about central tendency, we're going to talk about three different measures, the mode, the median, and the mean. What's important is that you know what these measures are, and more importantly perhaps is when to use them for different types of measurement that you may be doing, and also depending on some different characteristics of your data. We're going to talk about measures of variability, including the range, the sum of squares, the variance, and the standard deviation. Where necessary, we're going to talk about the distinction between the population and the sample formulas for these things as well. Now the sum of squares is a concept to which you may not have already been previously introduced, so you're especially going to want to pay attention to that part. In fact, all it really is is an intermediate calculation en route to calculating the variance and standard deviation. And it's going to be very important for you in an analysis of variance that you do in Psych 294. That's why we introduce it as its own concept here. Now before we get started, a little bit of computational notation. In particular, it's going to be important that when you guys see some of the things and the way that we write things in statistics, that you don't have to spend a lot of time or a lot of your resources trying to figure out what in the world it is that we're talking about. Now, the most important distinction that we make in terms of our notation in statistics is whether we're talking about a population or a sample. Now, in psychological science and in behavioral science in general, what we want to do is make inferences about the population. That we know. In other words, we're making claims, we have hypotheses about what an entire population of people do. We want to know about men versus women in general, or students versus non-students in general, or people from a certain type of household versus people from a different type of household in general. Okay, now that is the population. That's the entire class of people to which we want to draw our inferences. Now, in order to make some sort of inference about that population, of course, we can't actually go out and measure every single male and every single female. We can't go out and measure every single student in the entire world. So what we have to do is to draw a sample of relevant students or of relevant men and women, depending on what the population is in which we're interested. Now, the thing is, what we're going to then do is to calculate our statistics based on our sample and use that to draw those inferences back to the population. Now, what that means is we're going to have to keep clear when we're talking about population level characteristics and sample level characteristics. The way that we do that in our notation is to use Greek symbols, typically, for population level parameters. For example, we can talk about the mean using the Greek letter mu. We can talk about sigma, or the standard deviation. We can talk about the correlation we might see in an entire population by using rho here, the Greek lowercase letter rho. Okay, now we have then analogous symbols in the sample to talk about the same types of statistics. We can talk about the mean. We typically use x bar to denote the mean in a sample. S instead of sigma at the level of the sample to talk about the standard deviation. And we're talking about correlation. Okay, of course, then the corresponding instead of rho, we're going to use the Latin r instead. Okay, so the regular letters, if you will. So whenever you see these things, whenever you see us using a mu or a sigma or a rho, okay, or any other Greek letter, we're typically talking about the population. Okay, when we're using a Latin or a regular letter, then we're typically talking about the sample. Whenever you see us using especially uppercase or even lowercase, x, y, some of these things, these are variables or scores on variables. A capital Greek sigma is a summation operator. Okay, now when you see this, what that means is you're going to add up everything that comes after it. Now, the question here, though, however, you also need to be very careful about the way that you're using sigma, especially in terms of order of operations. So what you can see here is I've written two different things. On the left-hand side of this equation, what we have is sigma x squared. Now, on the right-hand side, what we have is sigma x in parentheses, and then that quantity squared. Now, do you think that these two quantities, the left-hand and the right-hand side of this equation, are indeed going to be equal? Well, the correct answer is they're not. So you have to be very careful, again, about order of operations and the way that you're reading some of these operators. Just like in basic algebra, when you're looking at order of operations for addition and subtraction and multiplication and some of these other operations, right? 
It's important to keep this in mind here. On the left-hand side, what we're doing is we're first squaring every single x value, and then we're adding up those squared values. That's what we have on the left. So notice what we're doing again with the summation operator sigma is adding up everything that comes after the sigma. Now what the parentheses do on the right is to close off the sigma x from the squared part that are squaring the term. In other words then what you have is you're first summing up all of the x's. After summing all of them up then you're going to square that sum that you end up with. Notice that's different than squaring all the x's first and then adding them all up. And you can use a very simple numeric example with three or four numbers for your different x's to prove this to yourself if you so choose. Now with that established, let's quickly introduce these different measures of central tendency. What we have here, as we know from the previous lecture on distributions, is a frequency distribution where each dot, each blue dot here, represents an individual point or an individual score that we might have obtained on some dependent measure, shown here on our x-axis, where then the number of dots, or the height of the different columns here, n on our y-axis, tells us the number of instances of that particular value that we've found in our data. Well, let's use this then to illustrate the concept of the different measures of central tendency. In general, the thing that we're interested in doing with central tendency is describing sort of the balance. If we could think of a single number to represent sort of the middle or the center of this distribution, okay, we see that there's a span of scores here, but we can think about at what point is this distribution going to balance? In other words, where's sort of the middle? or the central number to describe this distribution. That's in fact why it's called a central tendency measure. And the simplest of this is just the mode. That is, identifying the score that occurs most frequently in the distribution. Now, the thing to be careful here is when you report the mode, you want to report the value itself, not the number of times it occurs. So first, let's find what is the mode of the distribution shown here. What we need to do is to figure out which column reaches the highest. That tells us the most frequently occurring score, that is, the one with the highest n, and that gives us the mode of our distribution. In this case, the mode is a value of 12 in this distribution, because if you count up the blue dots, you'll see that it occurs 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 times. So again, be careful here. The mode is not 13, the number of times that the value occurs. The mode is 12 the value of the most frequently occurring score in the distribution. Let's move on and think about our other measures of central tendency then. How can we think about what the median represents in a distribution? Okay, the way you may have learned about the median is it's the 50th percentile, or the middle. In fact, what the median is, is the score that occurs in the middle of the distribution. That is, half of the scores are higher and half of the scores are lower. Now, if you wanted to go through and count exactly how many blue dots are on the screen here, you would see there's 107 scores, in other words, n equals 107, in the distribution shown here. Well, then if we want to find the median, that is the score occurring in the middle, what we need to do is to figure out the score for which, again, half of the scores are going to be above it, half of the scores are going to be below it. Now, with 107 scores, what that means is, if you count up from the bottom and shade in, say, the bottom 53 scores, and do the same counting down from the top, and in, shade in the top 53 scores. That means there's going to be one single score that sits right there in between those bottom half and the top half, the bottom 53 and the top 53. In particular then, this is going to give us the value for our median, which if you look here, by reading along where on the x-axis this score falls, we see that the median here is a value of 13. Now, the only other catch that you might have to think about with the median, and again, I'm sure you've learned this previously, is if you have an even number of scores, then what you do is you have to find the middle position, or take the average between the scores that fall in between the two top half and the bottom half of the distribution. In other words, if you have, say, 20 scores in your distribution, okay, then what you're going to do is take the bottom 10 scores and the top 10 scores. In other words, what you're going to do is then have to look at the 10th and the 11th between the 10th and the 11th score is where the median would fall. So what you would want to then do is to average the value of the 10th and the 11th scores to get sort of a 10.5 value that you're looking for. Okay, now again, that's not relevant to this distribution, which did have an odd number of scores.